Decision for Life. Welcome to First Baptist Church Indian Trail. I like all kinds of music. Uh, one of my favorite groups that has uh, been here a lot down through the years, haven't been in several years, but um, have, have been uh, in, in the past a lot. And uh, if you remember the little woman that takes, up, takes off of her shoes and uh, throws them across the platform with the McCamies. Do y'all remember the McCamies? And uh, th there's one of the songs that I absolutely um, love that they do. It's called God on the Mountain. And one of the phrases in that song, song is, yeah, he's God on the mountain, but he's also God in where? In the valleys. Uh, you found out and I found out that life is full of ups and downs and in and outs and through and around. So it, we, we just know that. Uh, if you've lived long enough, you, you understand that that's the way life is. Uh, let's see what the text says today about that in Psalm 23. Pick it up in verse number one, if you will. I hope you have uh, a copy of the Word of God in some form with you and maybe a pen and a piece of paper that you could uh, take some notes. You're gonna need them uh, this morning. But uh, the word says, the Lord is my shepherd. Say, say it out loud with me as we read it together, okay? The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside the still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Now watch this next part. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me, thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. Let's just stop right there and talk about this verse for a few minutes. Um, every time I go to Israel, we go over to what's called the valley of the shadow of death or the valley of death. It's a big, when you see that in scripture, most likely uh, one of the geographic regions that it may be referring to, I'm not saying it is, but may be referring to is a huge canyon. And it's about 800 feet deep. And you can get into the bottom of that canyon and you may not see the sunrise, you may not see uh, the sunset, and there are times even, or places even at midday in the bottom of that canyon, you will still be in the shadows simply because of the steepness and the angles of uh, that canyon. So there are places there where the sun never hits. Uh, in scripture, in 1 Kings, in the 20th chapter, there's a very interesting um, story. Uh, in that 20th chapter, uh, the Syrians, along with 32 other nations, decide that they are uh, going to come against Israel. And uh, so they do. These Syrians with 32 nations gang up against Israel. And uh, God just uh, routed those 32 nations, whipped them uh, decisively. Uh, a year later, the king decides, the king of Syria decides, uh, well, uh, I want to do this again. They may have whipped us that time, but we'll, we'll go at it with a little different strategy this time than uh, we did last time. So he calls his military advisors in. And uh, so they say to him, uh, king, now here's the problem. We went up against them up into the hill country and into the mountains. And everybody knows that their God takes care of them in the mountains. So let's lure them down into the valley. And we can assuredly, because we are so many more than they are, there's no way that they could possibly win down there in the valley. And so they mounted this assault lured Israel uh, down into the valley. And uh, in that 20th chapter, uh, the Bible says that those 32 nations just saturated 
the whole region with soldiers. And one verse says that the nation of Israel looked like two flocks of sheep among all of those armies. But the Lord comes along in the latter part of that chapter in verse uh, 28, and he says to the nation of Israel, uh, you're going to see victory because they're going to know that not only uh, am I the God of the mountains, I am the God of the valleys, I am your Lord. I'm your God, and everybody will know where the victory came from. May I say to all of us here this morning, those of you that are watching by television and by live stream, uh, may I just remind you today that God is not only the God of the good times, God is also the God of the not so good times that you may be in today. You know, the first 11 years of my life, um, I grew up on a mountaintop in one of the most beautiful parts of North Carolina. Uh, I'll just kind of show you um, a, a little picture of something my grandfather built uh, way back in the day that was two minutes from my house. This is called Sims Chapel. Uh, we know it as the pretty place. The pretty place. Used to go out there every Easter. Matter of fact, I lived right on, that's a dead end road, and I lived about two minutes from that chapel. And uh, my grandfather was the uh, caretaker of the YMCA camp to which this belongs. And I'd go out there every day with him. And so I got to see this beautiful spot. When I was 11 years old, though, uh, I moved off that mountain and uh, down in the valley. And the fact of the matter is I've been living in a valley uh, just about the rest of my days. Now, valley in the scriptures is also metaphorically given as difficult times, difficult times. Uh, I want to remind you that God is not only the God on those mountaintop experiences, you may be in that difficult time in your life. God is still God. And God is still good. You may be in a financial valley. You may be in a relational valley. You may be in a physical valley. But God is still God. And God is still good. Let me give you three things today about this valley I believe that God is talking to us about this morning. First of all, I want to give you the information on valleys in the scripture, if I could, for a few minutes. First thing, you may want to write this down, valleys are inclusive. Valleys are inclusive. They, they are part of our everyday experience. You just can't get out. They have a part of our everyday life to every one of us that are in this room. We will experience sometime or another uh, a valley. You're, somebody said, and I believe it to be true, you're either in a storm or you just came out of a storm or hang on, uh, you are headed for one. Uh, valleys are inclusive to all of us. So don't be shocked when they find themselves in your life. You cannot and we do not live on a mountain all of the time. There are going to be valleys of disappointment. There are going to be valleys of discouragement. There are going to be valleys of despair. There are going to be valleys of depression. We're going to have them in our life. Why? Because it's just a normal part of our everyday life. Deuteronomy chapter 11, uh, verse 11, I believe it was, uh, God was telling the nation of Israel, you're about to enter into a land of valleys and hills. You're going to be a part of it. So metaphorically, you have to understand when God says, yea, though you walk through the valley of the shadow of death, you understand that it is just part of his plan. It's part of what we go through. First Peter chapter 4, verse 12, uh, I believe Justin kind of preached on this sometime recently. Uh, when the word says, don't be surprised, when you are tested by troubles or painful suffering as if something unusual 
is happening to you. What God is just simply saying to us once again is that we get in a valley, it's simply part of life. So maybe instead of saying, why me? Maybe the better question is, why not me? It's part of God's plan. Next, not only is it inclusive, it's an inevitable. It's inevitable. Valleys are inevitable. To every one of us that are in this room, you cannot avoid them. Uh, they are impartial when it comes to picking and choosing. Uh, good things happen to bad people. Bad things happen to good people. Psalm chapter 24, excuse me, 34, verse 19 the Bible says, many are the afflictions of the righteous, but the Lord delivers us from all of them. So bad things do happen to good people. And if you're going through one of those valleys right now, God's not punishing you. God's not punishing you. We're living in a fallen world. I was talking to my mother who was just struggling for life itself a few days ago and, and, and she just thought, I, I know what's happening. God's just punishing me for the things that I have done. And I had to assure her, no, honey, God's not punishing you. God forgave you many, 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 many years ago and he doesn't even remember. So God's not punishing you. No one is isolated from valleys. No one escapes them. Matthew chapter 5, Jesus himself says it rains on the just and the unjust. Third thing is, is that not only are they inevitable, uh, they are inconvenient. Have you ever noticed that when valleys come to us, uh, they come at the most inconvenient time? Wouldn't it be wonderful if you could just go to God now, God, I'm not ready for any valleys right now. Um, you know, I've got this going on, got this going on. And, and, and so, God, if you could just maybe hold off on these valleys for us just a little while, it sure would be good. Or maybe a little bit later, you could go back to God and you could say, to, all right, God, I mean, I, I, right now is as good a time as any. So if you want to give me a valley, I, I guess right now would be a good time for me to have one. Uh, they never come uh, at a convenient time. Have you ever noticed how quickly a day can change. Have you ever noticed that your life could be upside down by a simple phone call? None of us know what's going to happen. None of us have an idea. It's always inconvenient when valleys do come. Now, not only the information on valleys, let me give you the anticipation of valleys, the anticipation of valleys. Since we don't know what's going to happen, and since we know uh, for certain that valleys are going to come, maybe we just need to look at uh, some valleys that God lays out for us in the scripture and maybe, just maybe, have the opportunity to get ready for them when they do come. Huh? There, when, when you see the scriptures and he uses valleys and, and, and it's it's really permeated throughout the Word of God. Uh, so I can't deal with all of them, but I want to deal with about four of them here for the next few minutes and just kind of talk to us about some of these valleys. First of all, I want to draw your attention to the Valley of Sidim, S-I-D-D-I-M. You find it in Genesis chapter number 14. There were four armies that were outside of Palestine. And uh, there were five tribes of Israel together. And uh, these four armies decided that they're going to come against the five tribes of Israel that were there. Uh, you may want to look over there. It's in Genesis 14. And uh, look at, uh, drop with me to uh, maybe verse 9 and verse 10. Um, with the king of Elam and the king of nations, the king of Shinar, um, Arioch, king of Eleazar, four kings with five. That's nine all together. And the veil or the valley of Sidim, S-I-D-D-I-M, Sidim, was full of slime pits and the kings of Sodom and Gomorrah ran away. They fled. 
and they fell in those slime pits. And they that remained fled to the mountains. Now just picture this, these nine uh, tribes are fighting against one another and the king of Sodom and the king of Gomorrah uh, tried to slip away. They tried to run away from the battle. They were fleeing the battle. And in this valley of Sedim were these uh, uh, tar-like pits. And they, they made the mistake of trying to get through them by running away. And instead, they fell. And when they fell, they got stuck. And uh, they were then found out by everybody around them. Uh, there's a lot of this. Uh, you can read on in the scripture and these other kings came into Sodom and Gomorrah and they plundered the whole city. They took away Abraham's nephew Lot and everything that Lot possessed. And I won't get into this. It's another sermon somewhere down the road, but uh, Abram found out about it and he went and rescued Lot and uh, restored Lot and everything that belonged to him that was taken. But uh, Sodom and Gomorrah, the kings, fell into this slime Pit. Have you ever been in the valley of Sedim? Have you ever thought that I got to run away from this circumstance? I got to run away from this responsibility. I've got to run away from this particular time in my life. And as you were running away, you slipped and you fell and it became a huge failure in your life. Have you ever had an occasion uh, like that? Sedim is a valley where you slip and where you fall and where you get stuck. And maybe you are there right now. Let me ask you, what are you running from? What are you escaping from right now? What are you trying to leave uh, behind right now? What is your dark slime pit that you have fallen into? Is it a nightclub? Is it a bar? Maybe it's a hotel room when you are out of town and nobody else is looking. When you study about Sodom and Gomorrah, they were known as sin cities of their day. I, I just want to encourage you here this morning. It really doesn't matter what slimy pit that you are stuck in and that you have fallen into. I want you to hear my heart. Jesus can help you get out of it. He is your escape. Maybe you are addicted to some substance. Maybe you are imprisoned by some morbid habit in your life and you can't break free of that habit. Maybe you are in a relationship that is unhealthy and ungodly and you don't know what to do about it. But God can help you out of that. Can you imagine the king of a nation? How embarrassed and mortified he must have been when he was caught secretly trying to run away from the battle and was stuck and fell and publicly humiliated. But I mean, you may be in it, but let me just help you. With God's help, you can get out. You may be in the place of your greatest failure in your life this morning. Can, can, let, let me help you. We've all been there. We've all been there. And the same God who helped us get out will help you out. Let, let, let me give you the second valley. It's called the Valley of Eschol, E-S-C-H-O-L. You will find the story in Numbers chapter number 13. And it's one of my favorite stories in all of the Bible. The nation of Israel had been in Egyptian bondage for 400 years. God sent Moses in to deliver them out of that bondage. He led them out and uh, led them across the sea. It was never God's intention for them to wander around out there for 40 years. They were only about three or four weeks away from the promised land, but it took them 40 years to get inside. They spent about a year at Mount Sinai. So they were led up to the very edge of 
the promised land and Moses sent 12 scouts over into the land to kind of scout out things and come back with a report. The Bible says that uh, some of them got over there to the valley of Eschol, E-S-C-H-O-L. And they came across some amazing grapes. The Bible says that one cluster had to be carried by two men. <laughs> That's some pretty massive grapes, isn't it? It was a land that flowed with milk and honey. It, it was an amazing gift of God to their life. But 10 of those scouts came back and they said, oh my, yeah, we agree that it's a land that flows with milk and honey and there's no doubt about the grapes and the pomegranates and everything else about it. It's just like it said. But there are also giants in the land and uh, they have fortified, walled up cities and iron chariots and giants that made us look like grasshoppers. We should have stayed in Egypt. We would have been better off in Egypt. We can't possibly go forward with this plan. Two of them came back and said, hey man, I've already got my mountain picked out. I know where I'm going to spend my time. God's already given us the land. Let's just go get it. Those 10 never got to enter into the promised land. They spent the remaining part of their days wandering in the desert because they saw that not as an opportunity, but they saw it as an obstacle in the valley of Eskol. Some of you right now are facing some obstacles or opportunities in your life. You are in that valley now and maybe you're like the 10. Yeah, that's a great opportunity, but yes, it is the direction I believe that God wants me to go in, but The valley of Eskol is the valley of fear. When you ask the question, uh, should I move forward? Should I move ahead? Should I obey? Should I go on? Or do I just give up? Mm -hmm. what, what, let me ask you, where are you today that has created this fear in your life? What opportunity is before you that has caused you to be afraid to go on and do what God has said to do. God's told you what he wants you to do. God's told you the right thing that you are to do. God has revealed this plan to you, but you're looking ahead and you're thinking, I don't know if I can do that or not. What if this and what if that, but this and but that, and, and you're just thinking, I don't know that I can do this. I, I, it would have been better maybe if I didn't know what I am supposed to know and do right now. So what are you going to do? Are you going to move forward in trusting God in faith or are you going to go backwards in fear and in retreat? Ten of them saw this as obstacles. Two of them saw it as an opportunity. What are you looking at? The third valley I want you to see quickly is the valley of Elah. And it's found in 1 Samuel chapter number 17. 1 Samuel chapter 17. David was a good little shepherd boy all of his life. He had trusted God. Uh, he had seen God do some marvelous and some amazing things. He writes in this passage, the Lord is uh, my shepherd. And his brothers were down there uh, in the army of Israel and they had been confronted by Goliath. And every morning, Goliath would come out and he would be on one side of the valley and, 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 and the army would be on the other and old Goliath would roar, Whoa, there's no need for us to have to fight. Just send me your best. And, and, and whoever wins the battle between us two then everything is settled and done and peace can be here. Just show me your best. And he taunted the nation of Israel day after day after day. 
So this little shepherd boy comes down and he says to the king, I can take care of this. Don't worry about it. But the giant would come out day after day. Shout across the valley of Elah. I wonder what valley of conflict that you are being confronted with today. What giant is out there that is taunting you that you don't want to address, that you don't want to have to deal with? What challenge is there? Maybe it's the challenge of your own marriage when your wife is on one side of the valley and you're on the other side of the valley and this conflict is going on and you're afraid to meet it head on and the challenge is there, but you're afraid of doing it. It's nothing in immoral but a shouting match. And your relationship is deadlocked because you've got the valley of Elah between the two of you. Maybe the last valley would be the valley of Baca, B-A-C-A. And uh, if you want to find it, it is in the book of Psalm and uh, the 84th chapter, Psalm chapter 84. And uh, in that chapter... Um, Baca means a place of weeping. It was a dry desert land, if you will. Dusty, arid, wasteland. Now, here's the deal. If you ever wanted to go to Israel, um, you see it in verse 6 there, who passing through the valley of Baca, uh, make it a well, the rain also dieth with the goods. Powerful verse. If you wanted to go to Jerusalem, you had to go through the valley of weeping. You had to go through the valley of grief. You had to go through the valley of wasteland and desert land. It's a metaphor. Baca is a metaphor for those dry, thirsty times in your life when the joy seemingly has dried up and you're in the midst of horrible grief that has overcome your soul. The Bible says this is the valley of weeping and nothing grows there. Nothing is productive. There's no fruit coming up out of that valley. It's just a valley of tears. Look with me, if you will, at verse 5. Blessed is the man whose strength is in thee, in whose heart are the ways of them, who passing through the valley of Baca make it a well. The rain also filleth the pools, they go from strength to strength. Every one of them in Zion appears before God. Mm. Some of you may be in that valley of Baca right now. Believe me, I know what that's like. Um, where there's no feelings. Um, you don't feel close to God. You don't feel close to your husband. You don't feel close to your wife. And you go through and you say, you know what, I, I'm just putting in my time. I, I don't have any energy. I'm kind of dried up, depressed, weeping, grieving. But the word says that when I'm in that valley of Baca, I am to be a source of refreshment. I am to bring water to the desert. I'm to bring springs to the dry ground. I am to water wherever it is that I go. God wants me to be a place of springs. And, and wherever I go, water just kind of shows up. And then in verse number seven, what he declares there is that you may be going through the valley of Baca and weeping and grieving and dry desert times and places in your life you go through it bringing water with you to refresh everybody around you so that you can move from one level of spiritual maturity to another level of spiritual maturity. Just growing in grace. God doesn't care about your clothes. God doesn't care about your career. God doesn't care about your cash. But what God does care about is your character. 
One of these days when we stand before him, he's not going to talk about all of those things. He's just simply going to say, hey, did you go from one level of spiritual maturity to another in the midst of all of your valleys when you were facing huge questions and confusions? Did you water those that were around you in the process of that? Did you grow spiritually to be who I wanted you to be? William Booth the founder of the Salvation Army. You know, it wasn't founded here in America, but he sent an old boy over here into America uh, to plan a work for God. And he sends word back to William Booth, said, man, I just can't get it started. I've tried everything. I've tried prayer. I've tried special events. Uh, I've tried all kinds of things to get this thing off the ground, and it's just not working. And William Booth sent him a message back, and here's what he said. It was a two-word message. Try weeping. And it worked. See, as you pass through the valley of weeping, you got to make it a place of springs. I sent my son a little note a couple of days ago when I was uh, pondering this message. I said to him, Kevin, I believe that God is using you in the valley of Baca to bless a lot of other people. And I just want to thank you for it. Let, let me give you one more. Is the expectation of valleys. And I got to hurry. What, what, what can we expect as God's people when we go through the valley? Write this down, will you? What can you expect as a child of God when you're going through a valley? What, what can you expect? No, number one, you ready? You can expect the presence of God. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil for thou art with me. You're not alone in your valleys. You're not alone in your hurts. You're not alone in your failures. He said he would never leave us and he would never forsake us. There are two words that jump out at me and it's simply this. When you walk through the valley, that means that God's not going to leave you in the valley. And the second word is the word you, how personal that is. You're not going to be in that valley forever. And then there's another word in there, the word shadow. The first sermon that I ever preached uh, back in 1973, 74, somewhere along in there, I, I did it on how long is your shadow. That was the name of my message. You, you know, shadows can't hurt you. They, they really can't. They, I, I, I want to give you two or three things real quickly about a shadow. First of all, they're larger than the real thing. Have you ever, have you ever stood on a street and you've had the shadow of a truck uh, pass by you and how huge that shadow is? Uh, I was standing in my yard the other day and a, and a bird flew over and, and the shadow of that thing about covered my whole house and I'm thinking, what in the world was that? Well, it was just larger than what the real thing really was. Uh, also, shadow, shadows can't hurt you. Um, maybe that fear that you have about death is because you're not ready to meet God. The, the third thing about shadows is, is that you can't have a shadow without light. Powerful word. So how do you do, deal with these shadows of fear that come over you, that fear of death, the despair, the depression. H how do you deal with it? Let me help you. You ready? Look at me a minute. Look this way. This is worth the price of admission. It, this is what you're going to remember about this sermon. You ready? What do you do about those fears? What do you do about the depression, the despair? What do you do about the valleys that you're in? Get your eyes off of the shadow and turn away from the shadow and look to the light. And you can deal with those fears and those problems. The Bible says, I am the light of the world. He who believes in me shall not walk in darkness. He who believes in me will, uh, stumble in, will not stumble in the darkness. I am the light of the world. The Bible says in him is no darkness. So I just encourage you, turn away from the shadows and turn to the light. The, the, the second thing you can expect uh, in your valley uh, is that God has a purpose um, Romans 8, I'll just say that, but here's another one in Romans 5. Not only so, but we also glory in our sufferings because we know that suffering produces perseverance. 
perseverance, character, and character, hope. And hope does not put us to shame because God's love has been poured out into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. And, and so when I'm in that valley of despair, and I'm in the valley of grieving, I have to remind myself, there's a story out there that is being written that I don't know about but I know who the author is. And God's a good God. And God can be trusted. The, the last thing is expect God's promises to be fulfilled uh, when you're in that valley. 2 Corinthians 4, for our present troubles are small and won't last very long, yet they produce for us a glory that vastly outweighs them and will last forever. One of my favorite, favorite songs ever is an old song, It Will Be Worth It All. Can I just tell you that one second after you get into heaven and you experience the unconditional love of God and you see everything that God has prepared for you, and in store for you. Eye hath not seen, ear hath not heard, neither has it entered into the heart of man what God has prepared for us. Let, let me just say, one second into heaven, and you surely will be able to sing, it will be worth it all. It'll be worth it all. It was worth everything. Matter of fact, I believe you'll be so caught up with what God has given you, you won't even remember what you went through. It won't matter. Regardless of what valley you're in, if you're not a Christian, it's different than those who are Christian. If you're a Christian, then the Lord is your shepherd. Um, there's one more valley that Joel chapter number three talks about. And he says it's the valley of decision. Do you know God knew you would be here today? God knew that you'd be home watching over the internet or watching by television. And he knew that this sermon was gonna be preached today. And he had you ready to listen. And right now, you're not in the valley of Sedim. You're not in the valley of Eskol. Uh, you're not in the valley of Baca, but you are in the valley of decision. And you've got to decide, is God going to be my shepherd or not? And this is your moment. This is your hour. This is your valley of decision and that you need to decide today, are you going to be for God or are you going to be against him? And may I say to you that your decision today really will be the decision for the rest of your life. It will affect everything else in your life. And my challenge to you is before you cut that computer off and before you take the remote and change channels and before you leave this auditorium, make the right choice. Make the right decision. Choose to let God come into your heart. Choose to let him be your shepherd. Stand with me if you will, please. Heads are bowed and eyes are closed. Heads are bowed and eyes are closed. How many of you would slip your hand up high enough right now, whether you're watching or whether you're here present? How many of you could hold your hand up right now and say, Pastor, I chose Jesus Christ as my shepherd a long time ago, and I know that he lives in my heart. I know he saved my soul, and I know that when I die, I'm going to go to heaven. Would you hold your hand up good and high right now all over the building? Just keep it up for a minute, would you? Just keep it up for a minute. Thank you. Hands are down. That means the rest of you are in that valley of decision. 
And today, I'd like to ask you to receive Jesus Christ into your heart and your life, to let him be Lord and Savior, to say yes to him. Would you right where you're standing, would you pray something like this with me? Right where you are at your television or at your computer screen, would you pray something like this with me? Lord Jesus, thank you for dying on that cross for my sin. Thank you that you rose from the dead, giving me hope that I can have eternal life. I know that I'm a sinner. Please forgive me of my sin. I willingly turn away from sin. And with your help, I'll live for you the rest of my life. Thank you for saving my soul. Thank you for watching Decision for Life. Our location, life group, and program information are available online at fpcit.org. We hope you will take the opportunity to join us in person. Thank you from the family of First Baptist Church Indian Trail.